You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about exciting, creative, and innovative ways of living. Produced in Santa Barbara, California, Sustainable World focuses on positive solutions to environmental challenges, solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics, earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe, how to plant a food forest, restorative design, or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned to Sustainable World Radio. I'm Jill Cloutier. And welcome to A Sustainable World, Diana. Thanks very much. And I went to your presentation last night at the Santa Barbara Public Library, and I had a wonderful time. I learned so much, and it was just so, so inspiring to hear um, everything that you had to say and to see your slideshow. So I'm really thrilled that you're here today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. What I would love to do is just start with, if you could tell us a little bit about your background and how you became interested in community. Well, I used to live in Fort Collins, Colorado, and at that time I got a job working for a clairvoyant named Gordon Gordon Michael Scallion who had a newsletter called Earth Changes Report, and he predicted earthquakes and various other kinds of natural phenomena. And my job was to be his research editor. And I had been interested in intentional communities for a long time. And he started talking about them in relationship to earth changes. And I got kind of intrigued. And then I decided to start my own newsletter about what it takes to start a new intentional community. It was journalism as a learning tool because I didn't know anything myself. But I thought that if I could I could uh, learn about it and use deadlines to force me into uh, to doing it. So I had a quarterly newsletter called Growing Community Newsletter. And soon after that, Communities Magazine uh, hired me to be their editor, merged the newsletter into Communities Magazine, which I've been editing for 11 years now since 1994. And so I became interested in communities on my own and then became a reporter about them and then became the editor of the national magazine about them. So I had a wonderful education. Plus, because I was working for the Fellowship for Intentional Community, which um, publishes Communities Magazine, they would bring me to various communities for their twice yearly board meetings. And so I, as their employee, I would need to go to those. And so I got to meet lots of people in communities. And naturally, I was always asking questions. Well, what would you do differently? Well, what worked really, really well? Well, what are some common challenges? Or what are some common benefits? And so I just picked up the pattern of what was going on in communities. That sounds like it was, so you just, from one um, job that you had earlier, then you just became immersed in communities. That's right. It was the total immersion method of learning about it. You know, maybe we should start, because some of our listeners might not even know, what is a community or what is an eco-village? And maybe if you could talk about the differences between them and co-housing as well. Sure, I'd be happy to. Well, first of all, the sort of overarching umbrella term is intentional community. And I like the definition that the... Fellowship for Intentional Community uses on the masthead of Communities Magazine, which is that it's a group of people who live with each other or next door to each other or at least near enough to carry out their common purpose together. And the key here is that they have a common purpose. And their common purpose can vary widely. For example, a group of friends in an urban setting can get together and rent a house and um, all have different bedrooms that they sublease from their self and um, create community together that way. They're common purpose is probably to have a good life with friends. Maybe they have an organic garden in the backyard. Maybe they recycle or do composting, and they just have a cheaper rent than they otherwise would have. That's certainly a form of intentional community, and I've lived in plenty of those. Um, Another common purpose for a community might be to have a retreat and conference center uh, somewhere uh, in, the, in a rural area that people would come to to take workshops and classes, such as Brighton Bush Hot Springs mm-hmm. in Oregon or Lost Valley Educational Center also in Oregon. And sometimes an intentional community has the common purpose to be a rural homesteading back to the land community. And sometimes it's to be an income-sharing commune. And the word commune really is an economic term that means um, we all work for the community business and the money goes into a common pot and we all get room and board in a small stipend. And there are very few communes, in my opinion, relative to the other kinds of intentional communities, probably no more than 10%. But some of the most well-known and large intentional communities in the United States are communes, such as Twin Oaks in Virginia, 
which is quite well known, or East Wind in Missouri. Um, another kind of common purpose is what co-housing communities have, and that common purpose, I think, would be to have a, a small, usually urban or suburban neighborhood, which is managed and developed by the neighbors themselves. So co-housing neighbors live in smaller than normal co-housing individual residents, and then together they own all the property and they own a large community building called a common house where they have uh, dinners for the whole neighborhood three or four nights a week. They have a laundry room and so on. Eco-villages is, is something else again. Would you like me to define sure, that? Uh, yeah, definitely. Okay. There's basically three different kinds of eco-villages according to the Global Eco-Village Network, and one kind is a kind of intentional community. The two other kinds are traditional indigenous villages where the people are living sustainably, and a third kind is a sustainability education center, such as the Eco-Village Training Center in Tennessee. And so the third kind is an intentional community, so it would be a place, and my favorite definition comes from Robert and Diane Gilman, it's a human-scale, full-featured settlement where human activities are harmlessly integrated into the natural landscape in a way that supports healthy human development with multiple centers of initiative and which can be successfully continued into the indefinite future. And if you'd like me to describe that a little more, I sure will. Yeah, yeah that was part of the slideshow last night and lecture that I really found interesting. And especially that I think the multiple centers of initiative was very interesting to me. So shall I elaborate yeah, sure. on that a bit for the <laughs> listeners? Okay. Well, human scale settlement means that whether it's just a few people or quite a few, more than a hundred or so, everybody knows each other. They recognize each other's face. They recognize, they recognize each other by name. And they feel that when they're making decisions together, say in their big community meetings, that they have a voice and an influence on the outcome of the decision. They're not just a nameless, faceless cog in a wheel. That's what human scale means. And the second part of the definition of eco-villages is full-featured settlement. So that might mean you live there, you work there, your social life is there, your spiritual life is there. Maybe you grow your own food there. Maybe you can buy needed goods and services there. Now you might be wondering, well, do any eco-villages actually exist? And I would say that most of the ones that I know about are aspiring. They're still in the early stages. They still don't have all of this in place. But to continue on, um, successfully integrated into the natural world means that the people, whatever they're doing, the, the what they're doing for living there and working there, and their other activities there aren't really messing up the water or the air or the soil and the soil microorganisms or the plants and the animals they share the property with. They're not stealing or borrowing from future generations by their activities. And then the next part of it, um, in a way that supports healthy human development, means that although this is a lot of hard work, they're not burnt out and exhausted. They still can have some fun and enjoy their lives. So it's not just that the soil and the animals are thriving. The people <laughs> are thriving, too. We can't forget that. And multiple centers of initiative is a new phrase that Robert Gilman added to his uh, famous definition of eco-villages, which I just learned about this year. And he told me that what it means is, well, in a family or a corporation, the parents or the directors and officers determine what everybody does, and then everybody does that. But in an eco-village, various individual people or families or households or groups of friends can on their own initiative decide to do something, like create a business or uh, a nonprofit organization or just come up with a project which they got the idea to do. They're doing for their own benefit, but the whole community benefits. So, for example, at Earth Haven, where I live, um, some of the folks said, we don't have a sauna, there's no money in the budget for a sauna, we'll collect donations, we'll get some donated materials, we'll do some work parties, and we'll create a sauna, and they did. Various other people at Earth Haven started their own individual businesses, which they derive an income from. So, for example, the Permaculture Activist magazine is headquartered there, owned by one of our Earth Haven members, Peter Bain. And um, Red Moon Herbs is there, owned by one of our members, Karina Wood. And while the people who own these businesses certainly derive income from them, they're able to to uh, hire various other Earth Haven members part-time, which puts more money into the community economy. Also, one of the folks, one of the families there decided to create an overnight lodging in their house for guests at Earth Haven. So they have some income from that. And Earth Haven gets to say, oh, well, we have both camping and indoor accommodations. So everyone wins. 
And the last part of the definition, can be successfully continued into the indefinite future, is sort of like the Six Nations Iroquois statement of we make decisions that'll be good for the next seven generations. We don't just think about what we're doing for right now. We think about the effect that we will have on people that come after us. After hearing your lecture last night, I wanted to pick up and move to Earth Haven. <laughs> <laughs> Could you describe to our listeners what, just, you know, a little synopsis of what life is like there? And Sure, I'd be happy yeah. to. Uh, well, there are there are various aspiring eco-villages around the United States and Canada. And I say aspiring because, of course, none of us really fits the definition. First of all, we're still harming the air and the water, even though we don't mean to or want to, because we, ha we haven't gotten all that pure yet. We're still in the construction phase, and we're trying to minimize our impact, but, but it's only minimizing. It's not completely excellent yet. Um, because we still have to drive to jobs when we have them and so on, because we're way out in the country. Um, the other thing is that how, how can we meet the definition of successfully continued into the indefinite future if the indefinite future hasn't gotten here yet? So <laughs> it'll be a couple of generations looking back before any of us will know if we're, if we're actually being eco-villages <laughs> in the true sense. So I'll just tell you a little bit about our, our project. Um, we're 60 people on 320 acres in a forest mountain setting in the Blue Ridge Mountains of western North Carolina, about 50 minutes from Asheville. And um, if you looked at the land at Earth Haven, you'd see uh, three converging stream valleys filled with a young forest of tulip poplar and hickory and Carolina pine and hemlock trees. And we have carved out little sections where we have houses and community buildings and footpaths and footbridges and our first vehicle bridge. Since I'm born and raised in California, it was quite astonishing to me to see rain falling for free out of the sky every summer. <laughs> I couldn't, I said, what is that stuff? <laughs> and they told me it was rain and it was quite amazing. And so there are seven streams and 16 springs on this property, which to me is an abundance of riches, because since I crave water. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> being born and raised in Los Angeles. And so, um, so what people do there is build small, tiny, passive solar natural buildings of earth-friendly materials. They're, the buildings are small because we don't get bank loans, partly because we don't want to and partly because we couldn't if we tried, because we all own all the land together, and we lease our tiny little home sites from ourselves. So we have quarter-acre and eighth-acre home sites. And so our buildings are passive solar always facing the south, and either timber frame or stick framed, made from wood that we've milled and harvested on the land. And then usually they have clay straw walls or straw bale walls or cob walls, usually earth plastered inside and out with metal roofs for roof water catchment. We have constructed wetlands, we have composting toilets, and um, you might be thinking, how can you get away with that? Well, we're far, far in the south and high, high up in the mountains of Appalachia, and we don't have zoning regulations, so we can have more people there than one could have in California, which is highly regulated. Could you explain what the zoning person told you when you were talking oh, that, about that? That yeah. was a building code person. <laughs> yeah, a building code. Well, I distinguish between um, building codes and, and zoning. Building codes has to do with how you build your building, and is it to certain standards that the building code requires? And that's a national building code. Uh, and the local counties and city government regulates it and enforces it and makes sure that you do it. Um, and the uh, the zoning regulations are have to do with the setbacks from the edge of the property and how many people can live on a given property or how many houses can be on how much acreage. So there's no zoning where we live. And I know very many people who wanted to start intentional communities and eco-villages who shopped the United States for places that did not have zoning regulations or didn't have them enforced specifically so they could have more people on the property and split the property payments between more people, making it more affordable. But the, the building inspector story that I have is that when I lived in California, uh, generally we thought that building inspectors were out to get you. Everybody that I knew thought that building inspectors were sort of like the Borg on Star Trek, and with their X-ray eyes, they could scan your starship looking for <laughs> violations and infringements, and then they'd write you up with glee, aha, I've got one, <laughs> and that they were basically, uh, you know, the other. And uh, so when I moved to Colorado, um, you know, as I'm moving more and more rural from Los Angeles and from the Bay Area where I lived, uh, the building inspectors were somebody's brother-in-law, and they had the Buffalo Ranch on the other side of your property, and they were basically really nice folks, and they weren't out to get you, and they gave you helpful suggestions. But when I got to s North Carolina, and I called up the building inspector <laughs> to find out about a storage shed, he said to me, 
why don't you build you one of them straw bales? I always want to inspect one of them. <laughs> and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. So we have straw bales and cob and straw clay. So to continue what, with what Earth Haven is like, um, so you'll find people working on their home sites, growing organic food, or still under construction because it takes a long time to build a building when you have off-grid power and you have to moderate how much electricity you can use in a day. And so everybody is off the grid. You see solar panels on the roofs or in the gardens of just about everybody there. And everybody's got a bank of batteries and inverter and so on. So it, the homes are small because, first of all, you can't b- get bank loans. And so you have to use existing money and work with savings or personal loans from family and friends. And also you're spending a whole lot of your money on solar power, which is partly because we're really cool and partly because solar power doesn't go that far up the mountain. So, I mean, you know, off, you know, grid mm-hmm. power. So we have to do our own. Uh, we also don't have any other utilities whatsoever except, of course, if you c- count telephone lines. And so people do telecute commute to work. So various people work various part-time incomes. Uh, I have a friend who makes candle lanterns, which is a wooden and beeswax candle, sort of backwoods version of a flashlight. And then he works uh, outside of Earth Haven, uh, going to uh, conferences where he helps sell the books at the book table. And he is also a counselor, and he also does odd jobs and construction Mm -hmm. work at Earth Haven. And so he has multiple sources of part-time income, and that's pretty true of most of the folks there. What you would see is a large community building where we hold meetings and a community kitchen where many people eat eat, um, meals, though there are 13 neighborhoods and sometimes the neighborhoods have their own kitchens and sometimes people eat in their homes. So we're going to be a village-scale community, which means it won't be like 20 people inside one house. It'll be 13 neighborhoods and you have to walk a bit to get to them. The farthest neighborhood is about 10 minutes from the center of our village. And you'll see people um, playing their trades. Uh, Some people are doing construction, and other people are installing solar panels, and other people are gardening, and other people are doing jobs like mine. There's two magazines at Earth Haven, Mm -hmm. Communities Magazine, which I edit, and The Permaculture Activist, which my friend Peter Bain publishes and edits. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's kind of like a forest mountain setting. What you would see is, is people walking along paths with dappled sunlight and ferns growing in the forest floor and you'd hear the sound of brooks and birdsong and chainsaws and skill <laughs> saws and people chopping wood and you'd see people working pretty hard. At night you'd see people gathering in the White Owl Lodge which is um, our one of our sort of social centers and uh, dancing or mm-hmm. singing or hanging out or doing yoga or playing chess because we come together for social activities as well. You know what it reminds me of, too, a little bit is when I went to college here at UCSB, that was one of the best times of my life because you really, I had that community feeling. Like, you drop by someone's house and hang out for a while. You get together for gatherings all the time. And I think sometimes as adults, we lose that sense of community. And we're kind of in our own little houses, and we don't see people as often. And it just sounds like it would be so fulfilling to have that on a regular basis. Well, I, I think it is. I, I wrote an article for Talking Leaves magazine about a day in the life at Earth Haven, and I used myself as the person, and I talked about how I got up in the morning and checked the water level to see if there was enough water to take a shower because we do roof water catchment, and then checked the trimetric meter to see if there was enough electricity to run the pump that pumped the water so it wouldn't run out halfway in the shower. And, you know, you have to kind of really pay attention to how you use resources. Then I went out and hauled the hum- humanure bucket out and dumped it, and then I hauled the urine bucket bucket out and dumped it. So th- I have this glamorous life as a magazine <laughs> editor, you know. And um, and it's pretty it's it's pretty hard work. It's hard and humbling work. But then I, I did say in the article that I had six hugs and it wasn't even breakfast time yet because <laughs> I was walking down the paths to go here and there and do different errands and would meet people. And so there's a lot of camaraderie. There's also a lot of conflict. More camaraderie, harder work, and more conflict than living outside of community. Mm-hmm. But what you have to do is resolve the conflicts which makes you closer and more connected and grows you as a human being. So you couldn't be having a feud with your neighbor, like those long, ongoing feuds that people <laughs> not only <laughs> with could the lawnmowers at 6 a.m. Right. <laughs> no, not only can you not have one, your fellow community members will not allow you to have one. The process team will come and find you and say, listen, we understand you and Reginald are having a problem. We're going to get you together and have a mediation. No, no, I hate Reginald. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, we're going to do it anyway. Because they just don't let you disturb the fabric of the community with ill will. You've got to heal it. 
So uh, my favorite quote about community comes from Zev Pace, who was a co-housing activist. And he said this about co-housing, but I like to apply it to all kinds of intentional community, including um, eco-villages. And he said, ah, oh, yes, community, the longest, most expensive personal growth workshop you will <laughs> ever take. It sounds like it would be great and also scary. <laughs> yes, it is. It's great and it's scary. But you quickly sort of get your sea legs and you learn that, oh my gosh, I'm going to be accountable for my actions. Everything I do is upstream of everybody else. I'm downstream of everybody else. We all affect each other. So you learn to be a more thoughtful and considerate person. So it's just a small microcosm of what we're doing on the planet. That's yeah. what I think. Mm-hmm. I, I think that uh, when you go to community and you're really, really mad at, say, oh, a particular government that might be doing things that you loathe, detest, and don't want your tax dollars going towards, that... that um, that as much as you loathe those aggressive actions that that government might be taking against other countries, my belief about this is that that's a macrocosm of the of all of us, and that where where we have leverage really, besides uh, what we might do in terms of social justice and environmental and peace activism, is also how we treat other people. And so, if I'm really angry at aggressions in the government. One of the things I need to do is stop being aggressive myself when it comes to how I treat my mom over breakfast or how I treat my fellow community members in a meeting. So, like, wh- where's my responsibility in this? Where's all of us? Can we create a kinder and more compassionate and humane culture mm-hmm. um, within our intentional communities and eco-villages? We'd better if we think we if we want to look at ourselves in the mirror <laughs> and and face ourselves. It's like leaving the peace rally and then having road rage on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's yeah. not do that. <laughs> well, I noticed too when I lived in Hawaii, I worked at a health food store in my twenties, and at one point these two customers came in, and you could tell there was all this tension between them, and then they almost got in like this verbal fight in the store. And then one of them went storming out, and I asked the one guy that stayed, I said, what's going on? He said, well, we bought land together, and we were going to have a community, and now we're in a loss. Like, it was the typical story that you say in your book, uh, and I know that you say that 90% of aspiring communities never get off the ground, and only 10% succeed. And I could just see, like, I mean, if you are with a good group of friends, and you're, you get along really well, you have similar interests, and, you know everything's positive, you play music together, can you, is, isn't that enough for a community, or you need a lot more? Uh, well, laying around in hammocks and taking <laughs> recreational herbal materials is not really enough to create community. In fact, it's probably going to destroy it. And so what I did, when I was first working for Communities Magazine, I, uh, to my great despair and discouragement, was noticing that about 90% uh, were failing, and only 10% were actually moving forward with their plans and getting the land and getting on the land together. And um, I thought, oh my gosh, what are these 90% and 10% doing that aren't the same? The 10% weren't just, I mean, the 90% that were failing weren't just failing in kind of a lighthearted way. They were having lots of conflicts, and sometimes they would end up in a court of law, duking it out with their hired gladiator Mm -hmm. lawyers. And these were people who had wanted to live ideals of harmony and cooperation. Brothers and sisters. Right, (laughs) connection and shared resources and cooperative decision-making. And there they were basically in a really um, hurtful stance toward each other, and it really was painful for me. It was heartbreaking for me. So I wanted to know, okay, what are these folks doing and what are these folks doing? Like a permaculture designer, I was trying to observe the landscape and see if there were any patterns, you know. And I did. I saw these really clear patterns about what the people were succeeding were doing and what the people who were failing horribly were not doing. And I thought to myself, oh, my God, somebody ought to write this down. And thus, your book. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Which uh, Do you want to talk a little bit about your book, or d- would you like to talk about maybe the top three reasons that communities fail or succeed? Sure, sure. Well, the book is called Creating a Life Together, Practical Tools to Grow Eco-Villages and Intentional Communities. It's available from New Society Publishers. It came out in 2003. It's available at bookstores, your local independent bookstore. It's available at big chains. It's available on Amazon. It's available from I- store.ic.org which is the uh, community bookshelf mail order service of the Fellowship for Intentional Community, which publishes Communities Magazine. So here's the top six reasons that I learned that communities failed. There are five reasonable reasons and one that's controversial. I'll leave that one to last. The first one is everybody needs to be on the same page for what the community is for, 
who we are, what we're doing, and why we're doing it. In other words, the basic mission and purpose. That needs to be decided, in my opinion, right mm -hmm. early on, and people need to agree on that. Sometimes there's more than one community in the room as people are meeting to talk about community, and it's really good to find it out then, before not Before you buy land. Before <laughs> you buy land. And so uh, I suggest that it be one of the earliest things the group does. Secondly, I think the group needs to choose a fair and participatory form of decision making because power, power over, and power abuses can occur around who makes the decisions and how are they made and in what way and if they're fair and participatory and, and even handed and the power is spread widely throughout the group, that will reduce loads of conflict later on. And if it's consensus decision making, I implore anyone listening to please get training, a two day training, a weekend training, because consensus is uh, not for the faint of heart. There are really important requirements for consensus. If the requirements don't exist, consensus is sort of like a chainsaw. Mm -hmm. You can chop a lot of wood or you can chop your leg. So the two requirements that are extremely important from what I've learned from all my consensus trainers is to have the common mission and purpose, mm -hmm. to be on the same page as to why you're there. And secondly, to have training. And thirdly, to have equal access to power. One person is not the boss and the rest employees. One person is not the landlord and the rest tenants. If there is a person who has all the money and can purchase the property, and everybody wants to be there together. This person can really benefit the community by being sort of the owner financer. But it's really important that good agreements are created about who makes what decisions. It's also really important, I think, to, to get a triple net lease arrangement to indicate that the owner is not the only person responsible for the taxes, not the only person mm -hmm. responsible for the um, property insurance or the upkeep and maintenance so that is shared and so that it's clearly delineated who makes what decisions about what. So there are ways that groups can mitigate against potential future conflict that comes from not thinking about this in advance. Okay, so that's two out of my six things. And the third one is to have clear agreements in writing and also in writing and also written down because sometimes groups think, well, we really trust each other, and we're brothers and sisters in spirit, and we, we've known each other for years, or we're, we're all of a common heart. And doesn't it indicate a certain amount of distrust to write things down? And isn't that somewhat insulting to each other? Let's just remember it. Well, this is one of the highest indicators for future failure in communities because people tend to remember things differently, even with the best will and mes the best heart in the world. So when people remember things differently, you said it was going to be six months and I'd be paid first. No, we said it was going to be 12 months and we'd all be paid at the same time. You're trying to cheat me. Well, you're betraying me. And so on. And well, that starts the chain reaction, I would guess. Yes, yeah. the nuclear reaction. Yeah. <laughs> and really, if we just w went to some kind of notebook with our decisions in it and looked it up under the decision about whatever, you know, looked it up, uh, w we could prevent that conflict so easily. So, uh, so that's the third one. And the fourth one is to know what you need to know in order to start a new community or eco-village. What, what do you mean, know what you need to know? Well, know the left brain things. How do, you do, how do you get financing? How do you purchase property? What the heck is escrow? How do you, what are points in a loan? Uh, how do you get a mortgage if you need to borrow money? And most groups do. Um, how do we create a budget? How do we create a strategic plan? How do we have a cash flow projection? You mean, you mean the universe won't do it for you? You mean <laughs> Archangel Gabriel from the fifth <laughs> level of the causal plane won't come down and keep your books for you? No, you have to actually get a ledger system or QuickBooks or something on your computer. And or a guide that did that in a past life. That would help. Uh, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> a, a, spiritual, a spiritual guide. Yeah, you need to know left brain things, and you also need to know right brain things, like how to do vision and visioning and how to... Um, make good decisions together and how to do good communication and process skills. This is really important because um, you need to know how to open your heart and be clear and transparent and honest and self-revealing and know what helps reduce conflict. My suggestion is that groups do this in the early, early stages before there's any conflict. Maybe they have a really good conflict resolution method, just like children learn how to do fire drills before there's any fire. It's just a really good idea. So um, that's, that's the fourth point. And the fifth one, let's see. Okay, the fifth one is to make communication and process skills a priority, um, learning them now ahead of time before we have 
uh, before we run into any real conflict. And the sixth one is the controversial one. I always say when I do workshops, okay, if you brought rotten tomatoes, this is the time to get them out because this tends to make people nervous. And that is to choose fellow co-founders and fellow community members with an eye towards first, do they understand and support the common mission and purpose? And secondly, do they have a demonstrated ability to get along well with people? And thirdly, are they relatively functional? Are they be able to make it in their life? Or are they desperately seeking community mm-hmm. in order to mm-hmm. have a great mom and dad that will take care of them? If they're having difficulty, if they're people for whom have had serious trauma and they haven't yet done very much healing before they walk into your group, they can create more conflict faster than you can say, mm-hmm. you'll be hearing from my lawyer especially if the group is new or if the group is uh, small or if the group is just um, not well established yet. And that's because people who have a great deal of difficulty, while I believe completely deserve compassion and kindness and courteous treatment, don't really make the best co-founders of a community that you're going to be financially and legally legally in bed with Mm -hmm. all the other people. So you might as well choose the people who are going to be like your brothers and sisters and cousins with great care because they will be your brothers and sisters and cousins. They'll have tremendous influence over your life relative to your decision-making method. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to choose them with care. Now, sometimes people, those with the tomatoes, would say, what? Isn't it community unless anyone can join? If you have to choose the members carefully, isn't that discriminating? Isn't that being unkind? Isn't that being like mainstream culture? And how is it community? Why? It's not community unless anyone can join. And I don't know how to answer that without doing a Vulcan mind meld and having people know what I've seen over the 11 years I've been observing communities. One of the largest reasons that communities fail is that one or more people became founders or members who created Mm -hmm. such disruption that the group basically disbanded. The most able and stable and functional people will leave first. Mm. So it's really, really important to choose people carefully. Also, you could get a person who joins the community who's a wonderful person, but they want to do something completely different. They have a different mission and purpose in their own mind than what the community is doing. So when there are proposals in the group business meetings about how we allocate our time, our labor, our energy, or our funds, some person can consistently block proposals because they want us to do something different. Do we mostly organically garden Mm. and we raise children? Or do we mostly raise children? Oh, yes, and there's a garden over there. What are our priorities? Where do we spend our time, energy, and money? And that's where your mission statement or vision statement would come in. Yes, your your mission and purpose that that the whole group knows and we know that we know it and we've got it memorized. That is what you return to in times of conflict and meetings. Well, I know in your book you had an example of a community that I think their um, source of money dried up and then they had a meeting and... Basically, a lot of the people there had different visions of what the community was for. Yes, exactly. And the really heartbreaking part of this particular um, challenge for communities is that people are already living together. They're living on the land. If they've left their home, sold their house, left their job, and come to live in community, Uh, rural communities, people often move across the country to move to them, and so they leave their jobs. Whereas in urban communities, of course, they keep their job, but let's say it was a rural community. And so all of a sudden, a crisis like our community uh, runs out of money, and we're trying to figure out how to earn money, and it comes out that, you know, Jack thinks we're here to do X, and Susie thinks we're here to do Y, and Reginald thinks we're here to do Z, and uh, so who should move away? Who is right? Who is wrong? Who should move off? Tremendous conflict and heartbreak. And it needn't have happened if the group was simply absolutely clear from the get-go what they were doing and why they were doing it. And anybody who joined them was thoroughly appraised of that. And they had to basically um, swear that, they <laughs> that, yes, that's what I want too, and I will support that. If the person who wants to enter the community does not want that, my strong recommendation is mm-hmm. that they and the community decide that they'll be friends and neighbors and stay friends and have lots of fun together, but don't join the mm-hmm. community as a decision-making member. And maybe would it be a good idea to write in your legal documents that you it is okay to say no to certain aspiring members it's not only okay to say no it's it's absolutely imperative and one of the great downfalls and difficulties for community groups is uh, having an unwillingness to say no 
partly because most people who want to live in intentional communities and eco-villages are compassionate, kind-hearted souls, and also because they might not have lived in community before, so they're not familiar with the phenomenon of doing the kindness for the person with lots of difficulty, which later ends up in all kinds of damage, possibly lawsuits and difficulties that the community has being drained of its financial and emotional resources. Mm. When, I t- when I talk about this at lectures and workshops, people who are younger or perhaps more visionary and idealistic who might have, you might say, stars in their eyes, start to frown and look perplexed and sort of like, well, what are you saying? I can always tell the experienced community members in the audience because they're nodding their heads <laughs> and rolling their eyes, and they've got this look on their face like, you said it, sister. <laughs> and then they come up to me afterwards and say, well, we had this experience that went on for a year and a half, and after that, we made our provisional membership period a year instead of three months because we really wanted to get to know people well first so we could know what to expect. Because basically you're entering into a relationship with your, the community members. That's right. In fact, m- one of the things I ask in my workshops is I say, okay, so was starting an eco-village or intentional community like getting married or starting a small business or going on a long trip with a complex itinerary and lots of baggage? <laughs> well, the answer, of course, is all three. And so people have to have the good communication skills that you would with your partner if you were in a love relationship. And, um, you know, it's sort of like a praise God and tie up your camel. You need good agreements and, and policies as well. And also you need to know how to handle the baggage because it will come up. And that is the um, the emotional baggage that people bring with them into any kind of group situation. Communi- we definitely all have. <laughs> yeah, community tends to um, be like the magnifying mirror effect. Um, if Jill, if you and I um, knew each other socially, we probably wouldn't notice these things in each other. We'd have lunch once in a while, and we'd be fine. If we lived together in the same <laughs> house, we'd notice things about dishes and dirty socks and so on. If we lived together in a community, all our childhood issues would come up, just like they do in a partnership or just like they do for parents of young children. And we would have to have really good processes to deal with them and heal them because that's partly why we're there it's your turn to dump the bucket no it's yours (laughs) yeah right right (laughs) diana maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about um, some other examples of eco villages sure i'd be happy to um another community that's quite different from earth haven in its physical appearance but very very similar in its intentions and its way of creating itself is dancing rabbit eco village in northeastern missouri and uh, this is 290 acres of tall grass prairie land formerly soybean fields and um, there's 30 people who live there started in 1995 so it's 10 years old and um, they are creating a small town of ultimately 500 to 1,000 people. And just like Earth Haven, they want to live more lightly on the land. They they use small passive solar natural buildings that they build themselves. And they're, what they build, though, is a straw bale. And uh, also they have um, the desire to be off the grid, and they mostly are off the grid with solar panels. They have a car co-op. What's really wonderful about the Dancing Rabbit folks is that they that you, that you cannot join and keep a car. The rule for joining is get rid of your car. So if you have a diesel car, you can donate it or sell it into their car co-op. So for the 30 people, they have four or five vehicles. They have vans, trucks, and sedans. The car co-op requires that you sign up to use the car and that you carpool. There'll be more than just you taking a trip. And what do you suppose they put in the gas tank? They put in biodiesel fuel. So, um, so, th- so that's what they do. And they also bicycle a lot. And um, people who live there, because they're so far away from any income source, practically have to be telecommuters to make a living and because people who live in rural communities still have to make a living. So they have graphic designers and bookkeepers and accountants and music booking agents and website designers and software engineers who telecommute to Silicon Valley and so on. And so that's how that's how they make a living there at Dancing Rabbit. Um, so, so that's one community. Another one that's considerably different is Eco Village at Ithaca, which is 175 acres, about two miles from downtown Ithaca, New York. And um, there's about 90 people, and they live in two different co housing communities. So, we talked about co housing earlier. At Eco Village at Ithaca, they decided to use the co housing development model to create their eco village. So, they have two co housing communities that are complete in, in themselves clustered together around a small man-made lake 
and then they have a 10-acre organic farm, a CSA farm, and they have students come out from Ithaca College and Cornell University to take credit mm -hmm. courses in eco-village design and so on. All the homes are beautiful and comfortable, and you could take your grandmother there and she'd be comfortable. Whereas um, at Earth Haven and Dancing Rabbit, one's grandmother would be saying, what? A composting toilet that's outside? <laughs> Are you kidding me? But they have indoor flush toilets. Unless she's a radical granny. Unless yeah. she's a radical, <laughs> maybe she's a red diaper baby, and yeah. she says, hey, sustainability's where it's at. Give me that outhouse. But, uh, yeah, so so down... Earth Haven and Dancing Rabbit are what you might call just a tad funky, possibly just a bit rustic, mm -hmm. whereas Eco Village at Ithaca is um, something the mainstream media loves. And it is quite famous, and it's been written up in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. And media crews have come to Eco Village at Ithaca from as far away as Japan and Spain. Wow. And it's quite, it's quite beautiful, and lots of fine folks live there. Um, Another example of an eco-village that's radically different from the others that we've described is Los Angeles eco-village, which is about 40 intentional neighbors who are tenants who rent from various small houses and two apartment buildings about three miles west of downtown L.A. It's in a working-class Korean and Latino neighborhood, and it's called the Wilshire Center Koreatown area of Los Angeles. Mm. When you're in this part of Los Angeles, the shop signs are in Korean letters or they're in Spanish. And so you can go into a shop that sells kimchi, and right next door you can get tacos. And so that's the that's generally the um, the the folks who live in this area. So Los Angeles Eco Village is a group of neighbors who um, are bicycle activists and public transportation activists. Twenty dollars off on your rent if you don't own a car, that's great. which is wonderful. At at Los Angeles Eco Village, people make decisions by consensus. They grow food in the backyard of the apartment building, and um, they uh, they also are avid recyclers, bicycle activists, they do composting. And I loved what the stories you told about some of the people in L in the LA Eco Village and how like the one man that hooked up a bicycle to his <laughs> oh, Would you <laughs> like to hear that story <laughs> again? <laughs> well, there was a man who was getting his PhD in sustainable village design uh, at UCLA and he was living there for the period of time he was getting his doctorate and uh, what he wanted to do was see how far he could take sustainable living in an urban setting. So even though he lived on the ground floor apartment, he and this is a two-story apartment, he put solar panels on the roof of the apartment above him. And then he ran wires down the outside of the, b the building and into his window. And he had a bank of batteries behind his couch and an inverter in the kitchen next to his refrigerator. And then he put a bicycle generator in the living room. So he'd hop on the bicycle. And between the solar power and him pedaling furiously, he'd create enough electricity to charge the batteries, which would run into the inverter, which changed it to AC power, which would power his television. So he, like a good permaculturalist with stacking functions, he would um, get plenty of exercise. He would charge <laughs> his batteries, and he could watch the evening news. You'd get in good shape and be very informed. Yes. <laughs> he took it even farther. He wanted to see, well, let's see, what, what, what if I recycled my shower water? So what he did is he got an aquarium pump and hooked it to the bottom bottom of his bathtub drain and pumped the water back into his bathtub <laughs> and he put little water hyacinths and other kinds <laughs> of organic aquatic plants who uh, which have as their job to uh, to change dirty water into clean he put little freshwater snails in there because that's <laughs> what they do too and then he put two cement blocks right where the shower water hit the bathtub surface water so that he could stand there on a little island and not step on any of his little friends <laughs> And now he is off. Um, yes. Promote, yeah. Yes. He he he's an uh, he's an Iraqi American and he speaks fluent Arabic, and so he's now in Egypt helping Egyptian villagers learn sustainable village design. That's a, that was so inspiring. What do you think the most important thing someone could do that wants to ensure that their community is off to a good start? Would you say it's like getting everything down in writing? And well, I guess it's the six things I mentioned mm -hmm. before. Uh, when I have a very short period of time and somebody says, what can people do to <laughs> ensure their success? I say, well, there's something I call structural conflict, which is conflict that happens later because the group did not put certain important structures in place right at the beginning. But if they put these structures in at the beginning, it's very, very likely that they will reduce certain important kinds of conflict. So again, what they are is... Uh, agreed upon mission and purpose, clear agreements in writing, participatory fair decision making, and if it's consensus, getting trained in it first. Um, 
knowing what you need to know, the right brain skills, the left brain skills, making communication and process skills a priority in the beginning, and selecting other people for emotional maturity and for uh, going along with and being able to support your mission and purpose. And what would you say are your the best parts of living in community for you? Well, I guess it's um, how much I'm growing as a person and how good it feels to live my sustainability values on the ground. Mm. I don't have to just read about it. Exactly. I get to haul buckets of manure myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I know last night you also talked about how you have a common like building and gathering place at Earth Haven. Could you give us tell our listeners a sure, little bit about sure. that? Sure, sure. We have a, we have a place owned by one of our members and leased by another called the White Owl Lodge and we we pay from 10 to 15 to 20 dollars a month for the privilege of being members of the co-op. Uh, if we don't pay that money, then we just pay a dollar a time that we go in. And what happens at the White Owl is uh, community dinners. That's like going out to dinner. You pay about seven or eight bucks for a very fine meal. It's like going to a restaurant, but you're still on the property. And pizza night and movie night and yoga and tai chi. And we have meetings there and, and special presentations are made there and workshops are held there. And then there's fermentation night, which is where they make kimchi and uh, sauerkraut and other items with, um, with microorganisms. So it's a wonderful social club and center for the whole community. And it also provides an income for one of our men- members. To be in an eco village, do you, is it more of an age group or people in their 20s, 30s, 40s? Is it varied all across the board? Well, at Eco Village at Ithaca, it's people of all ages. And that is true of Earth Haven, where I live in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. It's a multi generational community. The youngest person is eight months, the oldest is my 89 year old mother. Um, and so, I- and all the demographics in between. Dancing Rabbit, th- the folks are mostly in their late twenties and early thirties, and they're seeking people of other ages. Mm-hmm. Los so Angeles. It kind of depends on where you are. It and depends what on it depends on who gets attracted to it and who else is there. And most communities and eco villages are seeking to be multi generational. And I would love too for you to talk about your upcoming lectures and what you're going to be doing um, in the next few months, and then also contact information. And sure. if you want to talk about Communities Magazine, anything just to sum up. Sure, and yeah. sure. If anybody would like to get my book or Communities Magazine, which is a quarterly publication, uh, that's a store at, no, store.ic.org. That's the URL for the website. Uh, my book, which is called Creating a Life Together, is available in uh, most bookstores, and it's available online. It's available from Amazon. Um, Communities Magazine is available in food co-ops. Um, my email is diana, D-I-A-N-A, at I-C dot org. Thank you so much for coming, and it was wonderful to hear your lecture last night and then to share this time with you today. Thank you so much, Jill. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. For more information or to hear our other podcasts or interviews, visit www.sustainableworldradio.com. SustainableWorldRadio.com. Sustainable World Radio is produced by Jill Cloutier. Music by Dana Lyons. Thanks for listening.